if you are even contemplating that, you know, is, is development for me, then the best time to find out is now. Building wealth through property development, a beginner's guide. Today's mastermind is Stephen Chandler from the Property Development Institute in Sydney. He's been a developer for decades and we can't wait to discover some of the great secrets he has around property development. And he's here today. He is an author. He is a lecturer. He is a, he's the Property Development Institute course provider. He's a consultant, father of three children, uh, lives in Sydney, and when not developing, uh, currently do, he's working on a development at the moment, he tells me, uh, he enjoys fishing and watching cricket. So, everybody, put your seatbelt on. We are going on a property development journey, and we're going to discover a lot of uh, valuable information through Stephen Chandler today. Stephen, take it away. I'm too old to play cricket now. <laughs> you know, been there, done that. You know, so yeah, yeah. But I, I love, I love, I love that game. I love the five day game, the test, test cricket, one days, and the the T20s. Not for me. I love strategy. The strategy of a five day event is really does it for me yeah you know, that's that's yeah, property development you mentioned property development it's a, property development is all about the strategy and you know implementing your strategy seeing what's going on and change so cricket and property development i actually see is very very similar yes right because of the strategy involved yes. yeah yeah full on awesome excellent no it's great to have you here so some of the topics we will cover include um what is property development why use property development as a vehicle for wealth creation, uh, how property development works, can property development make you rich, uh, best type of development for beginners, what happens if it doesn't go to plan, um, how much seed capital you need, and mistakes, most importantly, oh well, quite importantly, mistakes to avoid in pre-construction, construction and post-construction. So, Stephen, is there a best time to develop? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now. Always <laughs> is that always the answer? <laughs> now, look, look, you know, if, if if you are even contemplating that, you know, is, is development for me, then the best time to find out is now. You no, know, and but I'm not just not saying, everyone's a developer. Cut oh, out God, to no. be a developer. No, 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 definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. You know, the, when when you to be a developer, you have to first understand the risks associated with what's involved and once you understand those risks you then have to within yourself understand whether they align with the risk profile that you are willing to carry mm -hmm. for the reward that it provides so you know you got a hundred dollars put it in the bank and i don't know what do you get you know, a few percent interest right now if inflation's chewing away you know, if, if you're getting, say, 4% in a fixed-term deposit and you're getting, you know, inflation's 5%, at the end of the 12-month term, you've actually, the value of your 100 bucks has has diminished. So it can't buy $100 worth anymore because it's $105 for the same and you've only got 104 You know, term deposits give you a return on your money, but your money never grows as well. So... You know, property development gives you the ability to get yourself a you know a, a substantially higher return on your money well in excess of what inflation is and you know at the end you actually have a choice of cashing that in or retaining the assets that you create and into the future those assets you know the, the standard thing in the, in the in the world has always been, hang on to a property and, you know, 10 years later, it's worth double. So, you know, that scenario, if you believe in that scenario, then, you know, do a development, keep the assets instead of taking the profit and cash and, you know, going buy the Maserati, the Lamborghini, whatever, keep a property instead. In 10 years' time, that property is going to be worth, you know, double, theoretically. Um, or buy your Lamborghini and in 10 years' time, it's worth nothing. Mm. You no. Know, what do you want? What are you trying to achieve in your in your life? Do you want mm. the flash fast cars, or do you want to grow wealth over time? And that's you know the, the thing about property development is you effectively and to try and make it really simple for people. If you have a a, a desire for wealth creation, then if you develop a property and keep it, 
you're effectively getting it at wholesale because there's no profit margin that's added to it. You're getting it at that wholesale price. So when you get the rent for it, the rent is a much higher yield because your cost base is lower than if you'd bought it at retail from a developer who'd completed mm. a project mm -mm. because you've got to pay him his profit yes. margin. Yes, gotcha. Very good. Little disclaimer for today. Today's discussion is um, doesn't constitute formal advice, and um, there's so many variables in property. I'm sure Steve will uh, attest to that, oh, well, that, that, that. That they <coughs> would need to seek their own professional advice. Look, this, this and that, that's a very very important point about about property development, Chris. You, you need a lot of advisors, mm, expert, a team. You need a, a team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, like I, I have a team of people I rely. On. I have who, who's in that team. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, a business advisor, someone who advises me at a very high level. They work for one of the large uh, accounting firms. They specialise in, in tax in the property side. So they advise me at a very, very high level. Um, I have my accountants and they advise me at, at the operational level uh, and they mm. you know do what needs to be done. That's the engine room of, of my advice. Yeah. And then I have a bookkeeper who keeps all my books up to date and make sure I'm paying my, my taxes or claiming my bass back, you know, all, all that sort of stuff, working working through that processing. So, you know, just on the financial side, I've got three levels that, that I deal with. If you're just getting started, accountant, you don't need the business advisor at that point in time. Your accountant will probably provide you the appropriate advice from a business perspective. Um, and that that's enough to get you started. Notwithstanding, I had a problem with a former accountant giving me some bad advice but you know assuming you've got someone who understands property and property development as your accountant at your you're well on the way then you've got your legal side because one, one of the things about our industry is that we have contracts for everything you've got to have a contract for your architects your, your all of your different engineers and there's you know, plenty of them that we, that we use um you've got to have you know you've got to get your finance at some stage so that's legal agreement um, you know, your building contractor, you know, there's legal agreements everywhere. So you need advice. So, you know, I have lawyers that, you know, I've got a, a property lawyer who specialises in property. <coughs> Pardon me. You, you know, imagine you're selling a property. You've got to create the contract for sale to sell that property. Now, when you're doing 30 of them, if you're, you know, doing multiple units or something of that, of that nature, you need someone who can manage that process of you know the exchange of all those contracts and when you get to the end the settlement of those contracts as well mm. so i have a property lawyer i have a construction lawyer i have a finance lawyer you know i i, I have a tax lawyer as well and you know the, the, don't use them every day they're not your everyday lawyer but i have a tax lawyer and when you get bigger and you you're, you're looking at asset um, sorry, uh, estate planning and asset protection, things of that nature, then you might need a trust lawyer, someone who understands trusts and how, how they operate. So there's a whole gamut of people that we need as developers, depending on the size that we are. But when you first get started, you do need an accountant who understands property and property development. That's very, very important. And you need at least two lawyers, one being a property lawyer and the other one being a construction lawyer. Generally, you would go to your property lawyer for everything. And, you know, when you get finance, you, you would go to them and say, look, you know, I need to have this looked at. They'll go off to someone else who's the finance expert and come back and say, look, we've got this advice for you. So, you know, those are the sorts of things. So there's part of the time. That's just your, your, your advisory, legal and financial advisory. Then you need your, oops, <laughs> there goes the speaker. Yep. Um, you know, your architect, your engineers, you know, all sorts of other manner of consultants who are experts in their own field to give you advice on what they do, whether they're designers or whether they're advisors. So, yeah, there's plenty of, plenty of people that we deal with. Yeah, no, that's great, Steve. So I wanted to have a little bit of a scenario where um, I'm coming to you. I'm 45. Uh, I'm sort of starting to realise that I'm not going to work forever. Um, my superannuation is not as high as I want. I want to make some money. I want to create some wealth. I need to. I need to create some wealth. I turn to property development. Now, um, yeah, just as a, you know, I want to put the, 
I want to pocket the cash, as you say. Yep. Um, I want to pocket some more cash than what I'm doing at the moment. So, so where, where, what is the first, as a hypothetical scenario, and there's um, other questions that are just related that I wanted to ask you as well. Where is the best place to start? What's step one? Learn. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that, that's just so easy. Learn. Yes. Because, you know, it's like property development is a career. Okay. It, is it, it is. a business? Oh, absolutely. Oh, God, yeah. Yep, yeah. And, 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 and are material costs, this is a little bit off the topic, but are they, so they're tax deductible. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a business expense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a business your, expense. Your timber, your concrete, your steel. So you need branding, website, that sort of thing? Yeah, so depending on what you're trying to achieve, um, if you want to do one development then run away, um, you know, what you would do is different. If you want to do multiple and make a business of yes. property development, yeah. then you have to consider whether or not you actually want to try to create a brand. Um, right. If you do create a brand, there's liability attached to that brand if something goes wrong and you don't action on it. You're going to destroy your brand. So you'll spend a lot of money building a brand, then something goes wrong, and then you lose your branding value. And in right. fact, you've got to cut it and start again. So a lot of, a lot of people don't look to brand um, for fear of what could happen if, like, for example, you're a developer, you might be 100% kosher with the way that you go forward with, with a development, but you end up engaging a builder and that builder goes broke and you're left carrying the can and mm. you can't meet all the obligations that the, the builder had. You're the one who gets tarnished. Even if you do meet the obligations... All of the, the, the tarnishing from the builder going broke, you're tarred with the same brush. Yep. So brand damage. So you, you look at um, with, with, with things like um, you know, Opal Tower, Mascot Tower in Sydney, with those, I'll just call them problems, Yes. Right. the brand damage to the developers and to the builders is enormous, mm. absolutely enormous, mm. you know, and... You know, as a developer, you've got to be prepared for that because you, you know, this part of learning about development is to understand who you are, you know, engaging with to deliver your project and you've got to be certain that they're reputable and that they're not going to leave you a bigger problem than, you know, what you're starting with. So learning is yes. really important. And so the knowledge will give you more confidence as well around, you know, because it's a big, I, I think there's a, there's fear, there's a fear related in not taking action around well, property development. It's, it's probably related to not knowing enough. Is that well, right? It, yeah, absolutely. If, if you, how, how, fear is the unknown. Yep. So it's Good as simple point. as that. Good point. I right? like that. Yes. So, so if, you, if you fill it in with the known, the yeah. fear goes down. <laughs> Do you remember learning to drive? Yes. You got in behind the wheel that first time. The adrenaline hit. It's like I, I've seen mum and dad do it before, yeah. you know. It can't be that hard because, you know, dad does it with one hand, you know, on the armrest and, you know, up here. And I have horrendous memories of my dad driving with his knees, you know, just, you know, relaxing on the, <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the on the highways, you know. And I just go, yeah. oh, my God, you know. Like, yeah. I look at that now and go, yeah, yeah. But I drive with one hand. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I know I shouldn't. I should always hang on to so the two. fire ready so sort of fire ready aim kind of kind yeah. of thing. So <laughs> so the difference so driving a car like that, the only thing you're risking is you're in other people's lives. Oh, not much, is it? No, you know, no. it, it's huge. Yeah. But and yet we still drive with one hand. Um, you know, in property development, we're only talking about money. And money is not as important as life. Mm -hmm. And yet we're blase mm -hmm. to go like this and you know, not be in the proper driving position, etc. So with, with property development, the key thing is if you can learn what it's about, and, you know, I don't say to people you have to go and get a degree in property development. You yeah. don't have to do that. Mm. What you have to do is read, watch videos. There's lots of free resources out there. You know, get on YouTube, get go to you know webs like you know, we've got free resources on on our property development institute website you know free ebooks and stuff you know beginners and you know more advanced stuff you can get into all of that sort of stuff read up on it and go yeah this isn't for me mm. because once you understand the risks and, and and this is the other thing when you read stuff 
if they're only telling you in this thing or if you're watching a video and you're only ever hearing about the good side of things, mm -hmm. right, you know there's a problem because there's a big downside and the downside is you could lose everything. So, you know, not many people will do that though, but what can happen is financial ruin is, is the worst case scenario. So there's, there's the fear, all right, financial ruin. But what, is the, the, what the real question is, is how likely is that? And I can tell you now, if you start a project without learning first, there's a high chance of that. But if you learn about property development first and start using the appropriate process, the likelihood of financial ruin drops dramatically. Mm. So, you know, learning is, is the number one thing you have to do. No, that's great. Great. Excellent. So say I've learned, um, I just want to touch on a little bit more. So the archetype, what is a great developer? Just Let's just say the avatar of a, of a great developer. What are they usually, uh, you know, and that can be anyone, but what do they usually consist of? Well, I, I would say it's someone who's got vision, yep. um, someone who can, who can see a need in the market. So, for example, you know, the late, great, you know, Lang Walker, you know, mm. may you rest in peace. You know, that, mm. that guy's amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. Now, yeah. he was a visionary, all right, right. Where, where people would say to him, you know, it'll never work, never work, never work. He made it work multiple times. Wow. You know, he had vision, he had focus. You know, developers have laser focus for the outcome. The really successful developers have for laser the focus for the outcome. Mm. They can see something. Mm. They can They're see almost it. more than a de developer. Like the development's sort of how they get there, but they can almost see where society's going to be in five years' time or something like that. Is yeah. that would that be fair to say? Yeah, they, 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 have, yeah, they have a vision. Yeah. You know, their, their crystal ball, mm. and, they, and this is the thing about property development, you, you've got to have a crystal ball. Um, just picture... So, so that means... That means designs what the market wants. So researching that, you know, trying to predict that, right? Is that yep. right? Yep. You, you said the word what the market wants. Yep. All right. Want is not a good word for us. What we're looking for is what the market needs. Right. Okay. So what you want, you want a Lamborghini. Yes. All right. What you need is a, a Corolla, right? Because you need to get from A to B. Yes. So you need a Corolla, you don't need the Lamborghini. Right. But if... I know you can afford more than a Corolla, right? The first thing I have to do is say, you need a car, right? So, okay, I've got to give you a car, right? But now I know that you earn more than that and therefore you want something a bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a product which is meets your needs of a Corolla but achieves some of your wants, which is a more performance-based vehicle maybe. So I create that better product so i might create a, an audi or something and sell you an audi which is halfway between a corolla and a lamborghini you know that that type of thing so understanding what the market needs is number one mm. right because i'll never sell you a motorbike so why would i produce a motorbike if everyone in the market needs a car yeah so that that's what it's about we have to as a developer know what the market needs and we have to know the market better than they know themselves because we have to be able to sell our product into the market. Yeah, yeah. Not easy to do. So people have built product we, that is not, is not is not is not market. Yeah. Have you got an example of a someone, <laughs> someone that built a proper product that well, wasn't market fit? Or? Let, 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 let me give you an example of something I'm looking at right now. Mm. So there's a um, a landowner that has been advised by an architect and by some other people to do this 100 unit development. Now they've got a an application in for this 100 units and you know, I, I look at the product that they've got, so the one bedders, two bedders, three bedders in this, this residential unit development and you know, the one bedroom apartments, they're the right size for the market. The two bedroom market apartments are dramatically undersized for what the market needs in that location. Right. Those two How do you know that? Through market research. Yes. Market research. You know, they, from, it, from other sales and... and yep, yep, other sales and through talking to researchers and engaging with our own market researchers to go and find out what the market needs. So it's, it, it's interesting from that perspective. So that, that develop And then their three bedders are miles too small as well. Then you look at their, what we call the apartment mix. So you know, how, what percentage of all the apartments are one bedders and two bedders and three bedders? And... We have standard mixes that we 
we do. So the standard thing in Sydney market, I'll just talk about Sydney market, is you know, 30% one bedders, 60% two bedders, and 10% three bedders. So that's sort of the mix that we do, and that works. And it sort of it all sells relatively quickly. So you don't flood the market with ones or twos, etc. So on their particular development, they were after you know, the architect made it 100 units. Now that development, looking at that development, at best 80 units of the right size. Uh-huh. So they're going to get to the end. They'll sell their one bedroom units. They'll never be able to sell their twos, right? And and their threes. They'll struggle with that, and that means financial difficulty for them. So that's that's an example. So if I took over that, the first thing I do is change it to give us bigger two bedders and three bedders. Then I would change the mix because there's too many one bedders and too many two bedders in this particular development. I'd change the mix to make it appropriate, and then I'd put it into the market. But I wouldn't do any of that without getting specific market research done for that particular site. So now, now I've done my, I've done, I've got some knowledge under the belt. Okay. Um, now, what about what about other? What, why choose development over? Just going and buying a rental. Mate, why, why does anybody do anything? You, you have a desire. So there's got to be something that triggers for you. Um, look, a, lot, a lot of people come to property development because you can make a lot of money. Mm. Right? Ooh, we can make a lot of money in property development. We can be rich and we can have the, the, the price nice jets risk, and all risk that Risk to reward stuff. ratio. Well, they, they, they don't look at the risk. They just see the reward. You know, And they've probably seen some of these... You know, training organisations that only ever sell the, the upside, never tell you about the downside. So, you know, those those type of things we get we get a, a, a false impression of them that that you can make a heap of money. So, one of the things that I do in my training and the very first sort of the one day workshops that I run, I say to people, my my goal in my first course, which is an inexpensive course, is to do one of two things make you go, oh my God, I want to make, I want to know more or ho, 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 there's too much risk in here, I'm out. You know, so I actually want to scare people or I want to make them fascinated in, in what, what actually goes on beyond just this sort of open, you know, I just start scratching the surface of what property development is. So if I can scare you, right, and I'll scare you off it, that's great because if I, if that happens in that first course, I see myself as being successful because I want people to be property developers. I don't want people to be a property developer thinking that they're always going to make money uh, because if they go into it with that attitude, they're going to lose money. Right? They have to be aware that there are risks everywhere and we as developers are risk managers. We identify risk. We come up with ways, mitigation strategies, ways to manage that risk, and then we implement those to make sure that we do manage. And then every month we're looking at all those risks and saying, you know, do I proceed? Do I keep going? Do I keep going? How, you know, what's coming up that's another risk? You know, what do I do with that? So we're always looking at risk mm. and going, how do I make sure this doesn't affect my bottom line? You know, in a way, it's a it's a risky activity, but probably suited to the risk averse, or, or you know, or some oh. sort of right combination of the two. You know, yeah, it, it is. You know, like if you're a risk taker, don't don't, don't do property development. You know, right, right, absolutely not. If you believe, you know, oh, I'm willing to take a risk. Don't do property development because right. because you can lose you it all. You don't want to, yeah. So yeah. You go to the casino, enjoy yourself. You know, yes. you, you, you're you know three hundred, four hundred thousand. It's too half big a, a risk dollars. to be taking a risk. Oh, mate, you, you're going to get smashed. You're going to yeah. destroy your family. You know, so just don't. Yeah, you know, if you're a yeah, ladies and gentlemen, if you are a risk taker, do not go down the property development path. Mm. It's not going to end well for you. Good one. Now, Stephen, um, I've I want to now locate a site, right? So. Um, what um, is choosing a good site or, you know, how do you go about it and, and is it a numbers game? Well, we're in it for the profit. Yeah. So it's a numbers game, 100% numbers. It's so, all so, about so, money. So just for people to understand, you, you look at a lot of sites, correct? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes. And then you'll, 
you'll just start to get a you get a pretty good feel of, for for prices and things, don't you? Because I, I was a I was in real estate, yep. and I used to look at square metre prices, and you'd get yep. very accurate if you had enough data. Is that similar? You know, similar type of exercise. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is all about the numbers. Like, you know, we're, we're in it for the profit. We're not in it for, you know, look, I love what I do. So I'm in it for that you know, personal gratification as well. But it, it is about turning a profit. You know, what, yeah. why would I do a project? Why would I put my capital at risk if I wasn't going to make money? Just for the love of it? I don't think so. You know, yeah. so, you know, you know, it's a capitalist society. I want to make money. And, you know, the more money I make, if, if, you know, and this is something else, you know, if, if you're more socially minded, you know, you can help more people when you've got money than you can when you don't have money. So go out there, be a developer, make money, you know, and help people with that money you make. So, you know, depending on what you want to do, but there's the fundamental is you still have to make money. Yeah, make it first. How you spend it then doesn't matter. It's up to you. What What's the best way, or there's probably a number of them, to, to, main, to make sure that your project is profitable? So right from the outset, you've got to know that your product will sell. Right. So you need to know what the market need is. So I'll, 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 you know, probably over the, 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 this podcast, I'm going to talk about that need all the time you know, because that's the fundamental driver. So, you know, if you understand... Costs? Yeah, that, 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 that's later, all right? But the number one thing is need because the need generates your... So once you know what the need is, so you might be looking at somewhere that's got a, you know, a substantial population growth, um, the, the population, the demographics of that growth may be you know, young families, people in their 30s with one, two children. Um, you know, that might be the majority. That's your target market. So now you know building... One bedroom units is not going to work mm. because they need to be family. So you've got to put two or three bedroom units or townhouses, you know, whatever it might be. But then you've also got to understand you've got young children, probably got both parents working, so they're going to be struggling with you know having young kids. Been there, done that. I understand that. You know, and from that perspective, they're not going to go out there and buy a three million dollar apartment. So you've got to understand where your price point is and what the quality standard is of the product that you're going to provide for these people that then will t determine what your revenue is going to be and then from that we work backwards and go you know, there's my revenue my tax goes off that the gst then the profit margin i want to make and then i'm left with the bucket of money for all of my development costs and then you know this is where the construction costs etc all come into play and you've got to be able to use that bucket of money that's left over to meet all of those costs. And when you get, get into it, there's an allowance that you have for land. And if in a particular suburb where this demand is, if the allowance that you've got at the bottom of that bucket for land is less than what the market price is, you'll never be able to do a development. Yeah. So... But if it's more, than and what that's the how you is. value the land in a way is what can you build on it and what can you sell it for? Is yeah, that right? So, so we we don't value land. So you know, if you've got three houses in a row, you, you get a valuer. You know, comes and they they'll value it and they'll say, you know, that property's worth one point five million. The one next door is one point six. The one next door is one point seven. So three different properties. We come along, look at that, and say, okay, if we put them all together, we can build thirty units then each parcel of land, we don't even look at the house, we look at the parcel of land, if they're all the same size, they might be worth you know, $2 million each to us mm. as a land value, right. right? Because we're not valuing it on the basis of what is the... Like if you sold that today, how much is it worth? We're not interested in that. We're interested in the dirt that that house sits on so that when we put our apartment building on it, it has a value, a residual land value. So we work backwards from revenue all the way back and we say, how much could we afford to pay for that land? Beginning with the end in mind. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. So if we can't get a number, if our residual land value is less than market value, well, well we, we won't... It's not even feasible. No, we don't yeah. even go. Talking about feasibility, it's a big word. <laughs> yep. It's basically your grand plan. Is that yeah. correct? Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. your project plan, it's financial your plan. Whole project plan. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. So with with that, don't forget, you can't fund a hundred percent of it. 
you've got to actually put your equity in to, you know, meet your, you know, the, a financier will lend a certain component. Yes. But you've got what to What is that? About eighty percent or less? Oh, substantially less. Substantially, you know, substantially less. If, if if you contemplate the total development costs, so all of the costs that you're going to incur. Generally, the highest you're going to get, j- just generally speaking, is about seventy percent. Yeah, that's still quite good, though. Yeah, but, but you need to have. Yeah, you. But, so, so. <laughs> okay, so here, here's the interesting part. You know, at seventy percent, it's going to be far more expensive than at sixty percent. So if you only borrow sixty percent, the interest rates, etc., the risk to the lender yeah. is lower because you've got more money in. You've got sure. the other forty percent. So the rate that you pay is going to be less. Whereas if you go seventy percent. Now, the lender's putting the majority of the money in, they want a bigger return, and they're taking a higher risk. Yep. So they'll want a better return. So they're going to hit you with extra interest and extra fees, et cetera. Mm. So, you know, whereas if you go to one of the big four banks, a big four bank may or may not even fund you, but they might say, well, we'll give you 50%, but their rates and everything are substantially less again. Yeah, okay, that's good. So, Steve, there's a bit of a thing from where I am, because I'm not a developer, I'm, and uh, you are, that, you know, you hear, oh, they put too many too many units on that, and they, you know... It, you, it, there's a mix between maximising the use of the land, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, and putting putting too much on there. It's just getting the balance right, that's, is it? That's the overdevelopment you're talking about. You know, yeah, oh, there's yeah. a bit of a thing, oh, they, you know, they, they just... So, sardines, they put too many in there. Yep. You know? So the question is, what are the planning controls? What do the planning controls say? And who determines what overdevelopment is? And you know, is there a need for the overdevelopment? That's the other thing. So there may be a substantial need. Like, you know, in, in the market right now, you know, we've got virtually zero vacancy rates on rental property. Yep. It's, it's impossible. Rents are going through the roof. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Now, that tells us straight away there's high demand for property. Yep. So where but is that property? you hear things like material costs, shipping problems, um, you so, know, interest rates, yep. uh, property prices have already peaked. What's your... I know that's a lot there, but... Yep. <laughs> so let, let's deal with interest rates very yep. first. So um, when I first came into the industry, I started in 1980. Uh, my father was doing a development. He was paying 24% interest on his development finance all right 24 percent all right and he made money all right so interest rates are just a business input into the feasibility so wherever you've got costs construction costs going through the roof it's an input into our yeah our costs right yeah now you know for us as developers not as builders the builders got that cost input which gets passed on to us all right so you know, we look at the builder's price, which has got all that stuff, you know, dealing with it. Um, inflation, we've got to contemplate our finance cost and we look at the return on our investment. You know, our cash that's going in, what return do we need on it? If inflation is high, um, you know, we, we need a, a high return. So throughout COVID, basically the development market, particularly in the residential side, died. <clears throat> Costs went up, it was dramatic. Um, you know, lots of projects did not start. Mm-hmm. So, and it's a good thing too, because if there'd been more demand for those limited mm. building supplies, mate, the prices would have gone up even more. Mm. So, you know, it was lucky from that perspective. However, the result of it is we now have a property crisis where there's, there's no property for <clears throat> everyone to live in. Yep. And, you know, we've got migration you know, the migrants coming in, you know, after we opened the borders again, you know, in the last year, I think it's been something like 600,000 people. I think they're talking about another 300,000 permanent migrants coming in the next 12 months and God knows what we're going to have into the future. Um, and let's not have a discussion about whether that's a good thing no, or a bad thing. Sure. But, you know, the, the fact is they've come in. That's good, Steve. That's good. Um, so you're saying that now is a good time to develop? Yeah, look, right now I think is, like, you know, here we are in... Why do you say that? Yeah, well... February 2024, just a date line this for, for people who, sure. who, who might come back to it in the future. Sure. You know, like, here we are, we've got basically zero vacancy rates. Um, right. We've yeah. got 600,000 people coming into the country right. last year, another 300 this year. Right. There's massive demand for property. Right. 
Migrants come in, generally speaking, they rent for three years before they buy. So, you know, there is a million people sitting there who need accommodation. We've got zero vacancy rates, you know, plus all the, the working visas and things like that. All these people need accommodation. So right now, we've got no projects starting. You know, the last three years through through the, 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 the pandemic, you know, no project started either. So we've got no residential property. Uh, so what happens? People it, it, need to live somewhere. Is it smart to find out, work with the authorities, find out what they want, and then you, they, is that related to the need? Is, is that well, how you work out that need? Because they've got to approve you, give you permits, etc. Yeah. right? So is it a good idea to network and know what's going on in that? It's always – information is very important, okay? It, it, being, do you do that? Being informed? Do, or... oh, I get it, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I talk to a lot of people yeah. all over the place all, all the time. I particularly like talking to business owners who are not in the property development or property game. No, because I want to know what's happening in their business, in their world. Mm -hmm. um, it, it helps me understand that they, they have a different picture, different view, because they're not associated. And I love those different views because it helps me form my view. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have to have to you know um, you know understand what government's doing. But keep in mind that governments can change every three or four years. Yep. And what one government does, the next one might revert. You know, they'll change again. So. Right. You know, you can't rely on them, you know, in the long term. What's the smallest amount? Now, it's probably not ideal. It's probably an ideal amount to, to develop with. But yep. what's the smallest amount you start with? You're probably talking about renovating a, an apartment. Yeah. And <laughs> if, okay. if you do that as a property development project where you don't live in it, all right, you, you actually you know, go and find one, acquire it, do the project and sell it, something of that nature. Right. If if that property, you know, if, if you're looking at sort of, you know, buying the property for a million bucks and selling it for one and a half, mm. something of that nature, you're going to need somewhere around like $450,000 yep. in equity, in your own cash to sort of do. Gotcha. And a lot of people don't have that. And, you know, I, I, I say to people who, who are looking at, you know, I want to, get into property development, you know, and they're picturing duplexes and townhouses. Mm. And I, I say to them, do it, do an apartment. Mm. Buy, renovate, sell an apartment. And, and they go... That's good. I've never thought of it that yeah. way. Yeah, and they, and they I go... Was like, I was like the other people. Well, they, they, <laughs> they think it's a renovation, yeah. you know. And I go, no, if you use property development strategies, then it's a property development project. It's just a little one, yeah. you know. But if it's your first one, I can tell you now, it's not a little one. It's huge, yeah. right? So it, it's relative. You know, it's, it's like, what is an old person? You know, you ask a 20-year-old what an old person is and you ask a 50-year-old, you're going to get a very different answer. Mm. You know? and, and, <laughs> and, you know, like from my perspective, what I, I know... I'm young, really you know, young. <laughs> well, depends on you, you know. Like, yeah. you know, but we all have this, we form a view. And generally, generally speaking, this is my view, an old person is someone who is 15 years older than you are now. So right. when you were 15, a 30-year-old was ancient. Gotcha. When you were 30, someone in their mid-40s was, oh, yeah. God. When you're in your mid-40s, what's an old person to you? 60. Yeah, yeah. there you go. All right, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... No, yeah, well, yeah, but, that's but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you do... do you start, so in, in property development... I haven't development, heard that. that was, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, it took me a while to get to that one, but it, 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 it made sense to me. Uh, but look, what... Property development is no different. You know, when you get started, a little one is huge. Yep. Right? And then when you do a six-pack of townhouses, 30 units is huge. When you do 30 mm. units, 100 units is huge. When you yeah. do 100, 1,000 is huge. Who's, yeah. who's that guy? Meriton? Yep. Yeah. He, he just seems to do hundreds at a time. Is that right? Thousands. Thousands. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Harry Trigoff, amazing man. Incredible man. Absolutely incredible. There's a guy who has... I mean, if you look at Lang Walker... Like, and, let's go and, from and, unit to trigger off, why not, you know? Yeah, but <laughs> he started somewhere. Yep. So did Lang Walker. Mm. You know, and you look at the two guys, you know, and they're, they're both icons in the, 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 the industry. Mm. Um, you know, Harry stayed completely focused on apartments and he's right. the apartment king, yeah. right? Lang started an apartment and in apartments, then he went into industrial and then commercial and then land subdivision and had a very diverse portfolio, right? Shopping centres, the whole lot, you know. So Lang... There's so many um, sectors, isn't there? 
Oh, if you want to be a property developer, everyone thinks, you know, oh, you've got to do housing, you mm. know, like, you know, apartments and, and stuff. You don't. Mm. You can do... What's your favourite? Resi. Yeah. Resi. Me- medium density residential. Why do you love Resi? Thing. Look, I've, I've done a lot of other stuff, industrial, commercial, you know, even been involved in retail development. And whilst it's fun, you know, I suppose is a way to call it, you know, I, I enjoy it. It doesn't resonate with me. What resonates, you know, in here is 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 residential. I truly love residential development, and and one of the reasons for that is um, it's harder than commercial and industrial stuff because commercial and industrial is business to business, uh, residential is business to consumer. Yeah. Uh, and that's a whole different level of complex dealing right. with people right. because when people buy an apartment, it's personal. Okay. Gotcha. Whereas if a business leases you know, an office space or a, 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 an industrial shed, mm. it's, it's business. Mm. It's just about making the money. So as long as it makes money, everybody's happy. But when you're selling to somebody and this is their dream home, it might be their first home, et cetera, that's, that's a completely different ball game, And that is complex because then you have to deal with people and, and people can be horrible Right, and it's a matter of you know having your own way of dealing with people that can you know make you successful, mm. and I love that that challenge if you mm. like. Mm. Yeah, mm. Steve, is it overseas or is it here? There seems to be um, using other people's money, building to rent, building to own that sort of thing. What, what's your what's your thought on that? Oh, I love opium, <laughs> opm. Not opium, OPM, other oh, people's money. Right. Right. So, <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> well, there's a lot of people with a lot of money yeah. who know property development can give good returns. Mm. But they might be a doctor or a lawyer or you know, a dentist oh. or a... You know, I don't, I don't, you know, Let me go money. make your money work for you something. Sort of exactly. And they've got money and they want to diversify their, their portfolio. I heard once, um, back out, there was a guy who used to work, I think it was... Um, O'Keefe's, I think it was O'Keefe's, oh some anyway, one of Packer's young guys said, look, I'll go and do the project, you put up the money and I'll split the profit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and made, he made a lot of money out of it, doing that. Is, mm-hmm. that. is that the sort of, is that is simply, That's, simplified, is that sort of how it is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, but you've got to have that skill set to be able to deliver on it. That's the key sure, thing. Sure, sure. So, so if, if I come, came up to you and I said, you know, hey, Chris, I'm, you know, I'm a, I've been a, a dentist all my life. Um, you've got a bit of money. Would you like to invest with me in a property development project? I'm developing, you know, six townhouses, all right? Now, uh, you would have to go, oh, my God, there's got to be a bit of risk in that when you've never developed before. Um, yeah, maybe I'll give it a miss this time, you know? Um, but if I came to you now as a, you know, person who's been in the industry for 43 years and I said, Chris, I've got this development happening, I'm doing six-pack of townies, you know, do you want to put it, you know, a bit of money in? Your view is very different yeah. with me coming to you with, you know, four decades of experience yeah. in the industry yeah. compared to someone who's never done it before. Sure, sure. So yeah. you, you, yeah, you yeah. look who, at the risk. It, gets, it, gets, it becomes very important who yeah. you are, yeah. who, who that person is yep. and, and what their track record is. That's awesome. That's good. Um, have you done it with other people's? Have you done it, or I'm doing it right now? Right, <clears throat> right. As we as we speak. Gotcha. So you know, it, it, it was interesting. My father, um, when I turned fifty, hard to believe I'm fifty. Hey, you know. But hey, talking about old people, um, when I turned fifty, my father said, "Hey, son, you know, two, two, two pieces of advice for you. Mm. All right, I said, let her rip, Dad. You know, this is going to be good." Mm. And he said. First of all, get ready. The bits are going to start falling off. And I go, what are you talking about? The bits are going to start falling off. And yeah, I've started to you know notice that you know these little things are starting to go wrong, and that's right. part of the aging process. Yeah. So that's number one. Checking the eyes, and, sort of. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> and and then the other thing he said was, um, don't put any of your own money into projects anymore. Right. And I've gone elaborate. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He said, you've got a heap of experience. Right? He said, you've got 30 plus years of experience. He said, that is highly valuable. Mm. Right? He said, people who want to do property development who don't know how, he said, you can use their money to make them money 
and make yourself money at the same time. Mm. And I've gone, oh, that's interesting. So I didn't believe him about the bit starting to fall off. I, I do now, but you know, I didn't believe that. But I, I, I listened very carefully to what he said about you know other people's money, and he has very specific experience in 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 that regard because you know he ended up going bankrupt when he was 51 and when he came out of bankruptcy at 54 and it, well, there's a bankruptcy story there I'll just elaborate that on, on that in a minute but when he came out of bankruptcy at the age of 54 he had no money and yet by the time he turned 70 he had a stroke when he was 70 and he couldn't work um, for, 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 for a while while he recovered but by the age of 70 he was a multi-millionaire right and other people's money. So, you know, he, he said, here's, here's a lesson for you, son, you know, as, as part of that, is, is that when someone goes bankrupt, they lose their money, they don't lose their mind. And in fact, their mind becomes far more educated mm. in the ways of the world. Mm. And he said, what I've learnt from that is massive. Mm. And yeah, he did projects as joint ventures with landowners and, you know, with investors and became a multimillionaire out of doing it with other people's money yeah. because he had a skill set that other people didn't have and he applied that skill set, shared in the profits, got paid fees for managing the projects, finding the projects, etc., and got profit share. Yeah, right. No, that's good. But just for a clarification yep. on that bankruptcy side, yep. he didn't go bankrupt because of property development. That's a really important thing. Yep. Um, we had embezzlement in the company and that resulted in by the time that was found it was too late and that caused him to make some business decisions that were very inappropriate and the house of cards fell down yep so that that, that taught, teaches another lesson about property development and that is asset protection now when you are going to develop you don't go and put it all on black you know you 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 have to be careful to protect your assets Yep. And if you don't protect your assets and something goes wrong, like this embezzlement scenario, you know, if if that is your project and someone does something in your project and sends it into a spiral, number one, you've got to be able to stop that spiral. But even if you do stop that spiral, there might be a huge loss in that. You've got to be able to say, well, okay, I'm only going to lose a finger. I'm not going to lose the hand. Yep. I don't want to lose that hand. I'm happy to lose that finger. Well, I'm not happy to lose the finger, but I might lose the finger, but I'll keep the rest. You know, you've got to really look at that as well as part of what you're doing. This is where your advisors are really, really important. Mm. So on that, just touching on it, um, you would have a certain structure, a uh, yep. special vehicle, yep. would you? Purpose SPV? Yeah, so every, every, every development I do is in a SPV, a special purpose vehicle. So it's a it's created specifically for the development. Um, you know, the likes of, you know, all the, the big brands, you know, um, you know Mervac, et cetera, I, I can't say what their structure is, mm. but they will have an SPV mm. most likely. Um, you know, they'll probably have an SPV for each project, but it falls under the Mervac umbrella. You know, so the way that, that that'll be done for tax purposes and then they might have guarantees, et cetera, under the brand, so that even if you buy off this SPV as, a, as an investor, you buy one of their properties from the SPV, the parent entity, the Mervac entity, will, will guarantee your, you know, the quality of your build. So that's something that, that, that is also very important is that who are you buying from if you're an investor? You know, are they a quality you know, developer? Are they a quality builder? And then this comes back to brand. If you want to be a, a developer yourself and you want to do this long term, if you're thinking, I don't want to build a brand, then what's going to happen is that every every project you do is a different brand and people are going to go, well, yep. who the hell are you? Yep. You know, like, you know, so you, you would then solely rely on the property and not the quality of who the developer is. Now, there's a common thought process that there's not a lot of land opportunities um, out there, but... I've heard it, if you look at Australia, 90% of it would not be developed. Am I right? 
Probably. Like, yeah. So there's, that's a myth. <clears throat> is, let, is that let's, right? Let, let's look, let, yeah. let me do a little comparison <laughs> yeah. that makes it really easy yeah. for people. Australia and the United States are about the same size land area. Yeah. Okay. Their population's, what, you know, 14 times ours. Yep. Yeah. We've got it's plenty of room over here to develop. Plenty of room, yes. Yeah, you there, there's your answer. Yeah. yeah. So on that, Steve, um, development in society, like people may have a misconception that it's, I don't know, Range Rover's a lot of money and, you know, but it's not, it, it, it's, it has a real purpose to serve society. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. A- am I right with that though? Like the conception of that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let me sort of put it this way. Um, in, in a lot of the training courses I do, I like to you know, ask two questions at the beginning. One is, um, you know, I ask, you know, a little, little bit cheek in tongue, you know, but I, but I, but I go, you know, raise your hand if you're, you know, if you live in a, a house, you know, a, a townhouse, a villa, an apartment or, or something similar, you know, and it, you, you're looking like, what's this guy on? Is he on drugs or something? And, you know, it's like, you know, okay, all right, well, then, then, then try this one. You know, in, in coming to the training course today, you know, raise your hand if you, you know, drove a car, yep. uh, caught a train caught a bus, you know, some sort of public transport, rode a bike, you know, or walked on a footpath to, to get here, yeah? And the fundamentals of those two questions are, like... They're all touching where, development. Where do you live? You know, whatever you live in, a developer was created through the development process, mm. right? The roads, the infrastructure that you use to get here is the development process. Government are developers. They develop mm. infrastructure assets, mm. roads rail, all that, it's infrastructure. So how important is property development to our society? It's massively important. So, you know, to be a developer, you know, we are creating the future. Uh, yep. You know, pe- people live in places, they don't even think that, you know, hey, this was actually created by a developer. You know, all the people who are anti law I had this gentleman, you know, objecting to a development once and you know, he said, oh, you know, if I can stop you, you know, I stop you, all right. But look, if you get it approved, can you let me know, and I'm, I might be interested in buying one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of stuff you get. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to stop you. But look, if you get it approved, you know, <clears throat> so, wow, right, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, so there's a you're sort of fighting against that mentality, but then not, oh, okay, it's happened. But I, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. Yeah, it's that NIMBY thing, you know, not in my backyard, yeah, but yeah. they forget the little bit at the end, which is unless you get it approved, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. In, in which case I want one. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Now touch on some mistakes, big mistakes that you've seen in in the construction part of it. Construction side, yeah. yeah. Um, Have you got any anything around that? Oh, tell me what you think a mistake is. Well, from what you've said, planning's knowledge, planning's critical um, feasibility. So I imagine inaccurate planning, not providing what the market needs, um, you know, costs, your costs getting out of control. But like, they may not be mistakes, but yeah, things, or, okay, no, 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 actually, the mistakes. What, 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 what have you got around mistakes? So uh, I, I look, at, there's two things in what you described there. One is you're talking about the planning. Of, of the building. So when, when, when I talk about construction, I'm talking about what the builder does. I, I'm, I, the, the other part of sort of right. what you're talking about is th- what what the builder is is going to be needing, to, what, it, what the builder has to do for you. So there, there's sort of two things. So, yeah. you know, in... <clears throat> Let's talk about the builder only. Right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what. I, yeah, yeah, just construction. Yeah, a physical putting it together. Yeah. What mistakes can, so the, can you've got to look out for there? Oh, the first and foremost, when a when a builder wins a tender. So you know, I, I used to work for builders when I first started. When as a, as a builder's project manager, when your company wins a tender and it get, you you are responsible for that project, the first thing you try and do is find out where the mistakes were made in the tender process. That, that resulted in you winning the project. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's where are the mistakes? Because right. there are, because you're, right. you're, you're tender, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be derogatory to the estimators in these building companies, yeah. but they have six weeks to price a, you know, a, a $10 million project or a $20 million project, you know, and they don't go and get quotes off everybody for everything. 
they have to do it based on experience and, and knowledge and feedback from other things. And a lot of it is, you know, we call guesstimating. Yep. It's their experience that says, you know, it's that. So quite often it can be that the price is wrong. So the actual contract value is too small to actually cover the costs. So oh, that yeah. that's a massive one. Yep. Because if should never have moved forward to the well, thing. should never have signed the contract. Yep. You know, their, their their estimate was wrong. When a builder has that And you'd really need to know your stuff to pick that up. Uh, oh, I, massively, yeah. So not only do the estimators need to know that, so do the, the builder's project manager. So the builder's project manager has to go through everything and go, Look, I, he, here is where I see the risk. All right? And then what they do is they'll go and get pricing for those things to determine whether or not there is a risk there. Mm. But once they start getting genuine prices for things, that's when you know the eyeballs, oh, might, we're in trouble. Um, right. you know, right. And when a builder gets in trouble financially you know who do they go to who's got the gold you know they go to the developer and try and get it out of the developer's pocket so they'll come with you know variations they'll find mistakes in the drawings you know the documents and it perhaps perhaps i'm not saying this always happens but perhaps they'll even like create problems you know to try and generate that type of you know the potential for additional income out of out of these supposed mistakes. Mm. If they can't get any money out of the client, well, the only other place they can go is to their subcontractors and suppliers. So they'll start targeting their subcontractors and suppliers. And if they've got a budget for on a plumbing of, say, a million dollars, just to make it really easy, mm. um, <clears throat> to do their project, they may need a plumbing company that's got 30 plumbers. Now, that plumbing company that's got 30 plumbers, all the prices might be 1.3, 1.4 million. But they found another plumbing company who's only got 15 employees, mm. but he can do it for 900. Right. So they go, oh, we'll take that 900, yep. so we'll save money on the budget. Yep. The only problem is that plumbing company is not big enough to be able to do the project, yeah. so it's going to delay the project, right. right? And then the builder and the plumbing company are going to get into dispute, mm. and that puts our project into a, a problem scenario, mm. and it's not good for us either. So the worst thing that we can have is a builder who's not making money. We actually need our builder to be making a profit yeah. so that if there is any problems, right. he's got a buffer to you know to lose, as it were, so that they don't come hunting us or their subbies. So that, that that's pro- probably that's the biggest mistake that we see is, is the tendered price is, is not appropriate. Yeah. So quite often, you know, if, if we get, you know, a handful of tenders, the, the, the lowest tender is generally a lot lower than everybody else. And if it is, you know they've made a lot of mistakes. It's very dangerous to take to actually contract with that builder. Usually you would go up to the next one. But if you are struggling to meet your budget, you've got no choice. You've got to go with that lower price, but you know you're going to have a hard time. Yes, yes. Now, with your team of people, you've just built them up over time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just worked out. Yep, yep. So you, can't, know, it, you can't force it; it just sort of happens. Yeah, but look, you 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 can you can force it. <laughs> you can force it. Yeah, but you want. Yeah, and 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 that is like, hey, Steve, I'm I'm I need an architect. Do you know anyone who might be good for this project? So you go and talk to people gotcha. in the industry, and I go, well, well, look, you know, I've used this guy, yeah. and you know, they're okay, or you know, she's okay over there. You know, you can try that firm. Yep, yeah. and you recommend just quickly again so you, you who, who's in your team architects i've got everyone that's accountant there. yeah yeah, yeah you've got everyone yeah. so I've, you know i've got that financial side i've got yeah. the, the, financial the legal side. side so you've got a good broker who'll you know finance broker yeah, yeah. Got a great broker yeah great finance so broker. you build a relationship and that's that's valuable too right because yep yep because yep, they yeah. can say oh i've known because you, know. you know like a, a lot of the time so in in because i deal with other people's money um you know I don't deal with the big four banks because I do stretch oh, stretch LVRs. You so don't do that. Right? No, no. I, I work with second tier lenders, yeah. and when you get into that market, some of those lenders are difficult to deal with. All right. Right. And you know, to get a seventy percent LVR, which yep. we were talking about before, yep. you know, then you're really stretching it. You are not in. You know, to get that money, you are talking potentially a third tier lender. You know, you're talking about high net worths. You're talking about potential shark territory, even. 
So you've got to be really careful to, mm. to stretch to 70%. That's why it's better to bring it back down to 60, 65, and you can deal with second tier lenders, which you know aren't going to take your leg off, right? <clears throat> But if you don't repay them, they will, yeah. right? You know, right. So, but you've got to be really careful. But yep. you know, when you know what you're doing, it's not too bad. Yep. Yep. Now, a little bit of um, fun and games. The positive, the optimistic, the crazy, you know, success stories. Dream car, dream house, dream holidays. It, it exists. It can. <laughs> it can. Yeah, absolutely. It can. Yeah. It can. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. you know, we... we because there's nice, healthy, you, you know, if you're a good operator, get it right, get the right need, yep. develop it efficiently, good contract, you yeah. know, oh every, everything everything goes to plan. There's some good good profit margin there, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, like our kids all went to, you know, private schools. <clears throat> you know, that was a, a, a commitment my wife and mate I had agreed on before we even had kids is we want to stick them into private schools to give them the best opportunity. Mm. And... You know, the, the opportunity, if you like, from private schools is that, you know, not only is it you know, the, the potential for a better education, if they're capable of that, but it's also private schools have a network. Yep. It's, it's networking. It's, it, it's teaching your kids networking because a lot of these private school um, kids go on into business and like, if you went and did a, a survey of all the CEOs, you know, in 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 Sydney or wherever, and you said, okay, you know, where did you go to school? Uh, There's a good chance that a lot of them went to, you know, these private schools. Mm. So, you know, I've always said to to my three kids, you know, you stay in contact with everyone from school Mm. because you never know where it could lead. Yep. Yeah, so that, that, that to me is really important, you, you know, networking for, for kids. So, you know, the kids did well. You know, we, we had a lot of holidays, you know, we used to go on holidays regularly. Um, lived in, you know, nice suburbs, nice houses, drove nice cars. Yep. You know. Well, not not you particularly. No, but, but anyone can. Yes, you know, I'm yeah. just saying, you know, here's yeah, an example. Yeah, no, like you don't feel like you need to talk about you, but... <clears throat> no, but that's yeah, okay, and I don't, yes. I don't mind sharing. You, yeah. If you want to know what, what, sure, what sure. it can do for you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm an example, yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm not Lang Walker, no, you know, so, sure. you know, I never took it to that level. Sure. But hey, I'm, I'm very comfortable, thank you very much. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, no, I, just to give... Uh, because you know, when I was you know, BRW rich list, you know, yep. they'd be cre- they'd be entertainers, uh, <laughs> standout entrepreneurs, or developers. You know, yeah. that's what it seemed to me. Um, so it, it's obviously one huge. of the greatest yeah. channels to create. Yeah, we're talking, you know, huge yeah. wealth here, yes. and that's not me either. But and, it's just for the and think for, for people all, who want to yeah. out there who are starting. But think out. of all the people who've got good wealth that don't even come close to the rich list. There's a yep. lot of people with yes. with very large wealth that doesn't even make it onto those lists, and I think they, they live going very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can hear that too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of people who make a lot of wealth that don't even come close to that list, and you don't need like you know, geez, if you had a hundred million dollars, well, that's a lot of wealth. That's huge. Sure. You know, and you don't even you don't need get that close much. to that. No. Well, you only need what you need. A lot of them got it through property yeah. development. Yeah. Yep. Like a lot of someone do. said, all wealth leads back to real estate. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, bricks Cause, and mortar. Because you've got to do something with it, right? You know? yeah. I'm, uh, look, I'm, 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 I believe bricks in bricks and, and mortar, mortar yeah. you know, because I can look at a building and say, that's mine. Yeah. You know, I, I can see it. Yes. And, you know, if the something share market that, collapses, yeah. Yeah, you know, like, okay, let's say you you own a uh, shares, you know, a BHP, right? And let's say, share market collapses and you know, their shares go from whatever they are down to you know almost nothing. And I'm not saying that BHP is, for God's sake, don't, don't, don't take that as a thing, but just an example. But if the share market crashes and your wealth plummets, right, your return on your wealth yep. is going to be tiny, yep. but I've still got that brick building I'm looking at over there saying that's mine and there's a tenant in there and they're paying rent. Yep. All right. Yep. I'm okay. Mm. Right. Because mm. as long as I can see that building, it's yeah, mine. Yeah, it yeah. is mine. Yeah. So I, I, I love to touch and feel yep. wealth. Do you like to drive by sometimes and just check? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, but it must be good. Finishing a project must be good to, you know, there's satisfaction in creating oh, something out of nothing. Yeah. Must be a big part of it. 
too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I love every every facet. I love the challenges. I love the the, the problems. You know, people say, you know, well, what, what's property development about? Uh, yeah. And I said, well, we're we're risk managers. Yeah. We identify risk. We manage risk. You mm. know, that that's what we do. We're, we're risk managers. You know, so mm. you know, you know, you, you think about it. Talk. Go come back to this crystal ball thing, right? Mm. I I have to have a crystal ball. And my crystal ball for the type of projects I like to do, which is sort of 30 units, I've, that, that's a two and a half to three year process. Mm. So for me... You're doing one of those at yeah, the moment? Yeah, at the moment. How's that going? Units, um, having a problem with finance. Right. You know, yep. But nearly nearly sorted. Yep. But, you know... So what stage... So financing is early on. So there's two different two different aspects to, to finance. You can finance yep. the upfront side to, you know, acquire the site and... Yep and you know do your planning stuff or you just get it for construction right so you know we're, we're looking at funding the planning stuff out of the out of the value of the land yeah so yep. just had a few hiccups there yeah but look when you, when you look at a, a 30 unit development that's a two and a half to three year project yep. before you pocket the cash yeah right so <laughs> the 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 thing is you know before you start a project I, i've got to look three years ahead and go yes in three years' time, the people who are going to buy my apartments off the plan yep. are going to be able to settle the transaction yep. and pay me mm. so I can pocket the cash mm. in three years' time. Mm. So, hey, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? Mm. Tell me that. You know, not sure, but yep. hang on, let me jump on the app and have a look what the Bureau of Meteorology says. Yep. Okay, And they do that based on information, yep. right? And they project what, what it's going to be. Mm. Well, great. We do the same thing. All right, but we're not talking about tomorrow. We're talking about three years' time. So we have to take information, right, process it, and say yes or no to putting our cash or other people's cash into a project that's not going to see a payday for three years. Mm. I mean, that's that's ballsy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And and you've got to understand the risks that can occur over that three year period, mm. right, mm. and how you're going to manage those. And there are risks that you can manage, and there's risks you can't manage. Mm. So, but you know, like we we consider so uh, a, a developer, you know, you've got to understand fundamental economics, yep. you know, the big picture. So, what is happening overseas at the moment, you know, with with Israel, Gaza, Palestinians now in Yemen, you know, the Red Sea, mm. you know, just at a at a very simple level for us as developers. If we are building anything, if we are importing anything, if it comes out of Europe and has to come through the Suez Canal and then through the Red Sea, well, the ships aren't coming that way anymore. They're going to ray around Africa. Yep. Right. That's adding you know, three weeks. Cost. Yep. Three weeks additional cost. Right? Bang. It's it's a cost to the project and a potential delay if you're in that construction process. Mm. But still, it's it's cost. We talk about inflation construction go, costs going up, anything that comes out of Europe now that's building-based, right, for us, you've got to be aware of that. Because when I do my feasibility, I have to know what's going to happen with building costs because I'm doing a feasibility today. I won't be getting a builder involved for a year, right? Mm. What do I put in as my building number today? Mm. I've got to know information. So yep. understanding, you know, that, Ukraine, what, what does that mean, you know, the the US you know southern border with Mexico what what's happening there the the fact that twenty five states had you know have disagreed with Biden about you know the border you know it's it, you know that's you know this is civil war territory you know are we talking about civil war now you know yeah. like what what does all that mean to us in you know globally and how would it affect our projects at what stage is it a no there's no turning back now like where where does that occur Pretty much when you sign the builder's contract. Yep. Yep. You're, you're, you're in. So you can uh, buy some land, but you, could, you, you don't necessarily need to push forward with the development, right? Do you know yep. what I mean? So, yep. that's, so, so that's still, you could still sort of pull out there, yep. right? But once you've gone with the builder, yeah, okay. So once you turn soil, that's, yeah, you're, you're, you're in. in. You're in. Yeah. You're in. Um, you can stop, even, notwithstanding, you can stop. But you're going to get into a Barney, a big one, 
with your builder, you know, they're going to argue loss of profit yes. and all this sort of stuff. You know, so you, you'd have to negotiate your way through that, right, or, or litigate if it, if it ended there. Mm. But so, but fundamentally, once you sign that building contract, you're you're really committed. You know? And if you're risk adverse, averse like like I am, you what what we try and do is pre-sell our apartments before we start construction. And the reason we do that is is if we've pre-sold them. We know that when we get to the back end, you know, the vast majority of those are going to settle and that will pay off our debt. And that's the biggest thing. You don't want to get to the end of your project and not have the money to pay off your debt. Gotcha. If, if you buy really well, good site, get it at the right price, you know or you, you, you get it right as far as what the market needs, mm-hmm. um, is 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 that the biggest the biggest part of, of, of making sure the whole exercise is profitable? If if you if you acquire the wrong site, mm. right, you're going to chase your tail all the way through. Yeah. But if you acquire the site properly, mm. the right site mm. it, it, under the right you know, with the right ideology, the right you know apartment mix and getting your market research right, knowing the need, all that sort of stuff. Mm. If you get that right at the beginning, then you give yourself the opportunity to really do well. Mm. Now, a lot of people are lucky. Mm-hmm. Okay? They'll buy a site, they'll do a duplex, and they'll make money. Mm. And they'll go, oh, you know, property development's great. But the thing that saved them is that the market's been kind. It's when the market is unkind, uh, that's when you start knowing. And markets right. don't always go up. No. Yeah. You know, they go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And we're getting to the point where now you also have to consider the the affordability side of things. So, yeah, you know, I, I bought my first apartment in 1985. Yep. Right, so I bought an apartment in 1985. I paid $73,500 for it in a particular suburb. Um, and my, my daughter's fiancé bought a similar property to what I bought in the same suburb, right, you know, 40 years later, mm. right, and, you know, he he paid, I don't know, yeah. 750000 for it, right? Yeah. Now, so t- 10 times the price. Yep. But where it gets really interesting is when you look at the, um, um, the your, your gross income. So mine, my gross income at that time was the purchase price was less than two times my annual income. Mm. So I was earning thirty eight thousand, I think, at the time. So you know, seventy six thousand dollars a year. I paid less than that. When I look at my future son in law, right? You know, it was probably eight times his income. I don't mm. know exactly, but mm. you know, it's probably mm. eight times his income. Mm. So this is affordability, right? So I could afford to buy that unit. He could afford to buy that unit, but it's eight times his income. Mm. You know, mine was less than twice. Mm. You know, so you look at the amount of debt that you've got to take on against your income to to pay a mortgage. It's it's massive, absolutely massive. So at a point in time, you're going to say, you know, with a husband and wife, how many times their gross annual income is too much to buy a property, mm. and people will stop buying, mm. and that forces them into the rental market for life, mm. right? And, you know, you, you mentioned early on about, you know, build to rent, you know. So now that things are becoming unaffordable, completely and utterly unaffordable, there's two things that happen. Either they go into the rental market forever or their alternative is to share properties with other. Now now we're talking about, and this is something that I'm looking at as a developer, now I'm, I'm looking at developing, you know, the, the potential, the market for, like, multi-generational apartments. So building, you know, six, seven, eight really bedroom apartments with three or four bathrooms, right, right. where mum and dad right. have got the equity, they can put a big chunk of the money into buying this whopping great big unit for everyone to live in, right? So grandma and granddad are in there, kids in there, grandchildren are in there. In one yeah. apartment. So yeah. mum and dad put the most of the money in. The kids, you know, they, they've got the income. They borrow the balance and they can afford to pay that mortgage, right? And then the grandies live there as well. So 
is is that the case? You know, there's a lot of um, um, you know cultures that already do it, right? Maybe it's something we've got to really start looking at in Australia. It's either that, or you're going to rent for life. Mm. No, but at least when you've got you know this multi generational thing, when when grandma and granddad do move on, you know, then the children become the grandparents, and their kids have their own kids. So you have this, and it all stays in the same name, the family name. So you structure it so that it's it's a family you know asset. Yeah, that's fascinating, fascinating. Now, Stephen, um, I want to just dip into um, the nightmare, the nightmare. So it, it, it goes bad, things go wrong. Um, there's, a, there's probably a number of variables that we've touched on that where, where it has gone wrong. Um, just talk to me, and you mentioned your father. Um, yeah, so, so um, I get caught, rates get out of my control, there's delays out of my control, uh, material costs... Just talk to me about, you know, what's it like, you know, have you, yeah, got any, anything around that? So, so the, 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 the worst case situation, yeah, yeah a, little, so a little bit more. I've never experienced one of those. Yep. So, you know, I've, I've, oh, sorry. I've experienced components mm. of it, but I've never, you know, had the nightmare. Mm. Right? But when, when you look at it... And, what, and you've seen some good people get caught just yeah. through no fault of their own. Is that is that right? Well, I didn't, mate, <laughs> you can't say no fault of their yep. own. There's always contributing factors. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you think about the things that can sort of... The, the, the major things that can go wrong mm. is uh, not getting an approval for your development. Mm. You're committed into this thing, bang, mm. and pff, nothing. So you might have acquired the site mm. with a particular value, a residual land value. So let, let's say that the A property was only worth one and a half if it was sold today, but you've paid two for it because mm. it's part of a development. Yep. Right? So you're assuming mm. that you're going to get your development approved. Right? So you then go and spend you know, a few hundred thousand bucks on a DA yep. and you get rejected. Yep. Right? So now you've overpaid for a site. Yep. You've paid even more money for a DA. Yep. And you can't do your development. Mm. And it's only worth one and a half million, but you've sort of wow. committed two point three. Yeah. Right? Instead of making your million, you've down five hundred. Yeah, eight hundred. Right. Know? So it's like, oh, you know. So yes. Then that process, when you look at that, I mean that that's scary. It's seriously scary, mm-hmm. right? You know, like who wants and, to And lose? easy to happen or? If you acquire your property the wrong way. Yeah. All right? yeah. So, And this is where property development, learning property development is really important mm. because, you know, in my father's era, because he was a developer and my grandfather was a developer as well, they always used to buy the land. So you buy the land and then you do everything, right? Yeah. Nowadays, we don't do that. Right. We control the land we right. sign agreements which are called option agreements right. that's the common way that we do it and what we say is we we will at a date in the future yeah pay two million dollars for your one and a half million dollar property yeah, right? yeah so we have the subject to, to sort of thing subject to yeah, yeah sub, subject to us wanting to settle yeah. you know? so we get an out clause but we still spend the money on the da yeah, yeah. if is there a downside for the person who... The landowner? Yeah. So the landowner will get an option fee. They'll get paid a fee up front. Okay. Right? And that is to secure... For us to secure the land for 18 months yep. and to try to get a DA, yep. we'll pay them an up, up front fee. And at the back end, they're going to get more for their land than what a you know, what its current market value is. Mm. So, and we agree that up front. So from their perspective, they get a chunk of money up front and... We go and invest the you know three hundred grand or whatever it might be for a DA, and if it gets approved, we've got no problem in settling and, and building our building. Right? If it gets rejected, then we've got the right to walk away. Yes, we're going to cop a three hundred thousand dollar loss plus lose the option fee, but we don't have to fork out two million dollars for a property that's only worth one and a half. Mm. So we're minimising our financial risk. Mm. So this is risk manager mm. identifying a risk. The risk is that we could have an eight hundred thousand dollar loss. Mm-hmm. Our mitigative strategy is have an option agreement, mm-hmm. and we can reduce that risk down to about three hundred fifty thousand. So we less than half the risk. Are you willing to do that? Yes or no? If it's yes, great. Okay. Keeping in mind that when you do your development, you're going to be making a good profit margin. Mm-hmm. So therefore, that 
the potential loss of that 350 you're willing to take. Yep, gotcha. It seems to be notorious, um, I don't know whether it's people I've known, but where developers will, will go bankrupt and then they rise like a phoenix from the ashes, you know. Like, and it it's, seems to be quite common. Can you talk to that? Is that is uh, it is it, yeah, is it an industry that got to be careful talking about that? Right. Yeah. There are. Look, I know of one particular but, developer but, okay, who's well, done well, that let me, regularly. Let me let me say let me say this. You can come back. Is that right? So it it, it <laughs> depends. Yeah. Right? It yeah. depends. So yeah. look, you know, it is not unusual for a developer to so you create an SPV. Right? Yeah. So you do a development. You know, and then a period of time after your development is finished, that company is sitting there. What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. It costs you money just to keep it there. So at a point in time, you decide to, you know, extinguish that company, get rid of it, right? So as long as you've complied with corporations law, you can roll that over and then, you know, start another one for the next project. So you don't, you know, there's no obligation to continue trading in the one company name. Right? So you don't have to keep trading. Yep. So as a developer, you know, generally we, we roll over our SPVs. You know, perfectly legal. Doesn't it's not good for your branding and for you know your you know credit file, but yep. it's a well if you do multiple projects in one entity, if over time something comes up on another project and it comes back to haunt you, mm. you know it can affect your profitability on your on your forward project. So right. you have to is make that got to do with character, thing. sort of thing. Oh, it uh, it's in the mix. It, it depends how you you, you look at things. But like I use SPVs because I do a lot of this other people's money scenario. Mm. I can't have you know, if I've got an investor for one project, and I've got different investors for another project. I can't have the same company doing both projects or finish one project right. and, and have new investors for another one in a company that's traded before because the trading history could come to bite the new right. investors. So when you use other people's money, you have to have a special purpose vehicle to protect them mm. from your past trading. Yep. Yep. No, that's good. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, how much of it... Um uh, yeah, so but, so it is possible if you if you do go bankrupt, you, so you, you, you you can't develop again. Is that ha- is that right? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No, no, <laughs> I, no. I just want to touch yeah. on that because I'm just curious. Yeah. Like it's more curious that so, they, they can't. Yeah, they they can't really be so attached to. If you think of it this way, all right, I'm going to I start a company, an SPV. That SPV is the developer, right? The the development goes bad, all right. It loses money. It gets wound up, liquidated. It's gone. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. I haven't gone bankrupt. I'm still here. Right. You know. Right. The entity carries that that risk. Gotcha. Yeah. So so that's how sometimes you hear of people having lost everything and then made it back. That's probably what went on. Yeah. Right. More that, like more yeah. likely. Yeah. So when when people like companies in Australia don't go bankrupt. They go into liquidation. Yeah. All right. Or they go into voluntary. Individuals do though, don't they? Individuals go bankrupt. Yeah. yeah. So you know when we talk about oh that company went bankrupt, that's actually wrong, right? What they're saying is they went into liquidation. Yeah. Or receivership or you know management, etc. Which is why you'd want an SPV. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, <laughs> I mean that that's a really important point as well is that yeah. if you're going to develop, you know. Um, if you develop in your own name, let's let's say you decided to go and do a duplex somewhere and you do it in your own name, and let's say you made half a million dollars from that project. So on the day that that profit is realised, your personal income mm. just went up by half a million. <laughs> you lose half of that in tax. Yes. Foop, gone. Yes. 250 grand, 50%. Good point. Good right? point. Whereas in a company, yes. company tax is only 30-odd percent. Right. right. So, you know, and... In a company, you can do different things, you know, and you can hold that money in that company or you distribute it to the shareholders, whatever. There's so many different things that you can do, mm. but 30% tax has already been paid. So yep. if it stays within the company world, and this is not financial advice, you need to talk to your, 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 your accountant about this, but if you keep it within that corporate world, you know, as a loan or something to another entity, there's just so many different things that you can do. 
Yep. So, you know, and look, you know, I own very little in my own name. Yep, yep. You know, yep. And that's, that's another secret. Yep. Yeah, that is. It is. It is smart. And, you know, if you're a individual who wants to go into property development, you've got to think very yeah. carefully about yeah. you're going to lose 50% in tax if you do it in your own name, mm. right? So you know, think about that. And at least in a company, and, and you in don't... The, in the company as well, if you're dipping into the pocket of cash, which I like, I like that pocket of cash. Um, it's only when you dip into it when you pay the tax, right? So you could leave it in there. Well, the company has to pay tax in any corporate in, in any given year. So yeah. that the, oh, the year that it gets the, the year that it right. Yeah, it, it'll be that. But for you, the day it's achieved, you've got the tax liability yeah, as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, not that you're against paying tax, but it's just making it My better. Look, making know, it better. <laughs> I, I, I love having tax problems. Yes. Because it means I'm making money. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's it, it, it's a good problem to have. Good and problem again, to have. This is where you need good structuring, good financial advice. Good problem to have. I like it. I like it. Um, okay, so I don't, I'm not sure what happened to my little scenario that I was trying to run with the uh, <laughs> the, going through the development. But, yeah. but um, so say we're getting towards the finish of uh, a, a development. Let's make it a 30 unit development let's yep. throw a bit of so we're pushing for home it must get pretty exciting towards the finish oh, I don't right know. i don't know if exciting is the right word no? intense is intense. a good one intense yeah. right what what towards the finish yeah yep. it gets intense does it yeah because yeah because you're so close the the yeah the, the, so the, um, you're looking at so look, the, to suspense. Give you an example, the suspense you, the, the builder is coming to completion you're you're really hunting that builder you know like yeah, you got to be finished you got to be finished got to be right. finished right? right so that that's number one and then it's like, finish quick, but don't forget to fix up all the, the defects, the things that are wrong right. before people move in because it's a lot harder once people move in, right? Yes. So fix your defects before you finish. Yep. At the same time, you're trying to get your titles, so yes. the 30 units, individual titles, the strata plan registered, uh -huh. all that sort of uh -huh. stuff, right? Then Is that is that a bit painstaking? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, that, 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 that's a podcast in itself. Right, um, sure. Then you've got um, you know, getting your um, uh, uh, occupation certificate, so your final approval to be able to occupy the building. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of certification and box who, ticking. Who certifies that? Well, you can do a certifier. Yep. A, a, are they, are they a, council? They can be. Can they be. can be council, or you can use private certifiers. Okay, but they've got to match. They've got to mirror the. There's regulations, the right? Council and the private certifiers are all all fall under the same legislation, uh -huh. so that technically they're the same. Yep. You know, just one works for council and one works for you know a, a private company. Yes, understand, understand. So with the with the sales, you've obviously that's been in your plan from the start, and an agents there doing pre sales. Pre sales are obviously very important. Yep. So yep. pre-sales are risk management. So it's not a it's not a new thing. Oh, now we've finished, now we sell. You've actually been selling from the start. So some people will actually build their building and sell later, all right, post-completion. Right. right. Why would they do that? Why wouldn't they want to get some... Because you get more money for a completed project. Oh, gotcha. If, if the market is the same or better than what it was when you were trying to pre-sell. Oh, yes. Because if you think about sure. this, right, you know, you walk into an apartment, you look at it. You can touch the touch the bench. You can see it, and then you, spatially you're aware of what's what. And you go, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Okay. Well, when you don't have one of those to sell to show people, you're relying on imagination. Mm. You're relying on what you can put on a computer screen or, yes. or create a physical model on a table. Yep. You know that type of thing. Yep. And it's a lot harder to sell something that you know based on you know a, a promise effectively is what we're doing we're promising we're going to build like this right it's very different to coming in and touching and feeling and seeing so it's you can't get the same price whereas if it's a brand new product it's finished you can come in and touch and feel you will pay more for that yep. than you will for something that you can't touch and feel yep yep so you know when when we pre-sell there's there's you know the the, the whole the, the the ideology of pre-sales is to minimize our risk as well so, you know, some financiers will say, we'll lend to you, but you've got to pre-sell 100% of the debt. So if, if you've got, a, you know, say a $10 million debt, they'll want $11 million worth of pre-sales, right? And that's what we call 100% because you take the GST off because you've got to pay GST. So, you know, $11 million in sales is $10 million in revenue for us. So they'll want to see $10 million worth of pre-sales 
so that when the project is finished and you start settling, they know they're going to get their money as soon as the building's finished. Mm. So, mm. and for me, I, I love that because I want to know that the one entity that could bring it all down at the back end of the project, the financier who could take it all away from me, is going to get paid off. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. what I'm looking for. You know, I want to pre sell so that when we get to the end, I can pay them out and they're gone. And that yeah. means yes. even, even if I've got some apartments left to sell, yeah. it doesn't yeah. matter sure. because then people can come and touch and feel and, and then we'll buy it. Probably get a nicer price on it anyway. Probably, yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. That is fantastic. That is awesome. Stephen, now, awesome. Now, for pe- anyone who wants to learn more, there's obviously Property Development Institute and Absolutely. yourself. Yep. 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 Um, any other suggestions for, you know, what what, what uh, a next step for, for, for people might be? Uh, look, you, you, first and foremost, you, you find the free resources. Yeah. That, that's it. Yeah, you know, get onto YouTube or, or Vimeo, wherever you like to get your yep. your video content. Jump on there, have a talk to people. No, have a talk to people. Watch, watch people, you know, learn about different aspects of, of property development. Really important, though, if you're going to listen to someone, make sure that they're actually developers. Mm. All right? right. So that, that's... They are who they're... Yes. Yeah. You, you, you want someone who's come out of the industry who's actually got a, a career... Yep. that you can actually see and follow and, and, and track. You know, like, yep. you know, if anyone wants to know about me, they can go to LinkedIn and you know, do a search and they can find me and they can see what my history is. Yep. So it's all there. If you're going to learn from someone, make sure they have been in the industry yep. Yep. for a long time. Yep. You know, and if you're going to learn from someone who's young, be warned. Yep. They don't they haven't, have they don't know a the lot mistakes of mistakes they haven't learned yet. Yeah. yeah, they haven't learned those mistakes. Yeah. Yes. So so yeah, first and foremost do that. You know, free resources, websites. Um also be be a little bit aware that when you go to a lot of these training place websites and you download their free brochure on whatever it is, a lot of those documents are just sales pitches, right? On my website. I deliberately don't do that. I do deliberately have... There's two books on my website which you can buy from Amazon if you like or you can go and actually download for free from the website. Um, And I've also got a development guide. So, you know, I believe in providing genuine information for people because Mm. I just want more people to to do it. So once you've, you've sort of got some knowledge about what development's all about, then you have to... You know, commit to the next level, which is you're going to have to pay for the learning. Yep. Uh, you just got to oh, find... that's a good point. Yeah. So investing in not not because you're in education, but it's it's it is important to invest in the learn. You know, learning. Hey, hey, you've got to pay to do a first aid course. Yep. You've got to pay to <laughs> to do. You know. Yeah, you know, uni costs you. Yeah. Money. No, because I, I saw yeah. somewhere that one of the developers had spent a hundred thousand dollars on his. You know. This guy's worth a lot of money. Um, yep. So yep. that that just shows that yeah. you, you need to invest in yourself. And, you know, uh, that, as they say, your best investment's in yourself. And, and, and remember, property development is a career. If you think you're going to be a doctor without going and get yourself educated and paying for it, yep. you, you, you yeah, know, yeah. you're never going to be a doctor. Yep. If you want to be a property developer, you can do it two ways. You can actually do it where you, you can pay for some education to get you prepared for your first project or you can go and do your first project and find out the hard way and it'll cost you more than what you, the courses would have cost. Yep. Stephen Chandler, thank you so much. Thanks for coming in, mate. That was fantastic. A lot You're of, absolutely welcome. A lot of value there. Thank you so much. And um, so I've pocketed the cash. I've got there. We've settled with your guidance, with your information, um, and we know where to find out more. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. And, you know, hopefully one day we'll uh, we'll have the sequel. (laughs) I'm looking forward to it, Chris. Thanks for having me.